what what I would do for what it's worth is just download that whole folder. Um, but bear this in mind. So, and then you will have that project. And if you double click on that on your machine, once you download it, it will open our studio with that project. Um, and you'll have the different uh, scripts and stuff and folders. So I do make changes to it, right? Um, so, but you can always go back there. I'll leave the access there and get future scripts and just add them to what you established. So I would I would download it and I would change the name of stuff. And then, you know, things are pretty solid for labs one and two. I just, I tweak stuff a little bit, but you'll have all of the data and what's there and everything. And, and that'll probably be a, a good enough basis for you and the other thing you can do is just, if you've already set up a project in your area, is just add these scripts to that area. Um, yeah, just making sure, I mean, that everybody could get at these so that they can tweak them with their data set. So if you can kind of try to do that as I talk, all, all I'm gonna do now is I'll get into are um, with this project because I sort of live edit this um, and and show you you know how the different scripts work and for lab two uh, and then you you'll be able to modify yours to work with your data and, and I'm sorry this is the easiest way I can think of getting you this stuff but um, if you get stuck with it, just let me know. I'll try to help as soon as I can. Okay. So hopefully that link lasts now that it's working. And I'll go over to our... So I'm in the... There's in the in the grad stats underscore our project. Um, what many of you would have used in lab one were those you know bunch of scripts. That's the one with the box plot, bivariate graphs, and stuff like that. And uh, we're now into the subfolder lab two, and you see a bunch of our scripts there. I know of a two-way correlation power analysis, GLM, blah blah blah, and so I won't take too much of your time here, but um, I just wanted to do like a t-test, a two-way ANOVA, and we'll do um, oh, multiple regression. And that'll start us getting into uh, stuff that you have to do in lab two. Maybe just before I do that, I'll show you lab two. You haven't looked at it yet. So, and and kind of don't get too excited about some of the stuff, like, again, to confront those assumptions that I was talking about. We're going to look at, just in a second, um, the important assumptions of GLM and how, how you use so-called diagnostics to assess them. Um, and then one of the very common things that you do to kind of help better satisfy the assumptions are transformations of the data. And you've probably heard about log transformations of data. You know, if, if the data, sometimes the phrase used in papers, unfortunately, is the data weren't normally distributed. So I log transform them. Again, that kind of makes my skin crawl to hear words like that, but I'll explain that in a minute. Anyway, Part of what you do in the lab is do the t-test, as you can see in question one there, comparing uh, between two groups and then the log transform value of, of your uh, quantitative response variable. And you look at the diagnostic to see if that helped in, uh, in better satisfying the assumptions. The other thing you do 
in the lab. Um, and again, it's another one of these things, kind of like Mike's data, that the, the script that you use for it is based on something uh, a student in the course did, oh, it must be eight or nine years ago now. So back in the day, you know, when I taught this course up to, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, um, if the assumptions of uh, general linear models, parametric stats weren't satisfied, anybody know what you do, what you did back in the day when they weren't satisfied? Because it still happens now. I think I saw it somebody's paper, but anybody remember that? So the, the main assumptions and the ones that we'll worry about are, as I was talking about with the t-test, um, homogeneity of variance. The variance is about the same in the groups. Um, the other one is normality of residuals. You know, the residuals or the variation within a group is approximately normal. Um, and then uh, when we're talking about uh, linear regression, whether it's multiple or simple, linearity of in the relationship between response and predictor variables is another important assumption. Um, so if there's good evidence that those assumptions don't hold, then as, as you do in the lab, and I'll talk about this next week, um, you can do transformations. But the other thing that people used to do commonly are so-called non-parametric stats. So that's and there's a bunch of those, but they really boil down to one thing. It, just think about it in the case of a simple linear regression. The, the Western profs, the salary was the response variable. The year since highest degree was the predictor variable. And instead of using the actual numbers, basically what you do is you plot or you, you analyze, you put them in order. The two lists, you know, you've got two quantitative variables, Y, X, response, predictor. Put the Y, the response variable, in order from the person who makes the most money to the person who makes the least money. And then put the year since highest degree in the order of the person who's the longest time since their highest degree and the shortest time. And you sort of see if those two ranked lists line up, you know, Bailey's making the most money and it's also been the most year since his highest degree. And that's basically non-parametric stats in a nutshell. You know, is it, if it's the case that year since highest degree doesn't matter, then sorting by highest degree, year since highest degree, it's not in any way going to jive with the salary sorting, right? Whereas if it totally controls it, the two lists they're going to be pretty much the same order of people. So they're going to jive a lot. So, so non-parametric stats are doing that. Um, most people don't use them anymore. Or they're, not, they're not necessary anymore. And, and you get a great example in the lab of what to do that's tons better than that. Because think of what you're losing when you build a model. And instead of using the actual numbers, you're just you've got the ranks, right? But so the person making the most money, that's related to the person who has the highest number of years since highest degree. So you, you, you lose the actual parameter, like how, how much does each year since highest degree affect salary and all that when you just go to ranks. So what's far more common now with, you know, computing power now is, I mean, I don't want to, you know, my mother's old one. There's more power on my phone than Western had in its mainframe computer when I was doing my PhD. It's actually true. <laughs> um, I kid you not. It's one of those moments when I feel like, gee, living, not legend, but dinosaur or whatever. But so what I think of as homemade null distributions where you use randomization, you use the power of the computer to build a null hypothesis distribution. So you don't have to presume, you know, that thing about the normal distribution of sample means and, and all that. Um, you build it and test, test your null hypothesis. How often would I expect 
these data with this the null being true and here's the distribution from a homemade so you'll do that um you just do that with a t-test it exists for all these various models but and then two-way ANOVA multiple regression uh independence tests logistic regression which a lot of you probably haven't used so that's where you have a categorical response variable and the toxicologists among us will be familiar with that you know did the did the fish live or die or did the rabbit <laughs> did the rabbit hide under the log or did he stand up on the the bird bath that's like a sublethal toxicity test which sounds absurd but so that's logistic regression where instead of like a quantitative variable like the length of the shell you've got some which category was it in so you'll do that and then uh, you'll do a power analysis at the end that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks okay so let's just do a couple of tests to get a feel for them and uh what have we got teed up here and this is just using mike's uh mike thorne chinook data and by the way mike emailed me today i sent him an email uh a while ago just saying mike uh, he works for uh he works for MNR now. I said, Mike, uh, you remember when I you gave me these data? Like, and it's got to be. I forgot to ask him how many years ago. It's been a while. I said, it, Are these data real? Like, I got this stuff about lamprey and that. Did I just make that up? And he sent me a, a great note today uh, saying they're real. They're from uh, a couple of uh, streams in southwestern Ontario. Um, and the, even the lamprey, the, the yes, no lamprey attached, it's actual data from the fish. So I was really, he sent me a photo, which I'll post on our uh, Canvas site of him holding one of the fish. Okay, so let the fir first thing I'm going to do is just, I'll run this script and then we'll uh, take a look at it. But I want to run it and you can see what happens. Um, and what what plots and other information come out so this is the t-test two pops it's a comparison of uh two populations with respect to a a quantitative variable and we'll start with the nice stuff so you know you get relatively beautiful i say modestly um relatively beautiful plot there in the lower right with a title Mike Thorne Chinook salmon data set and then subtitle t test of fork length and millimeters by lamprey attached question mark and then um, you can see the two box plots and again so just because it's a real t test this this would be potentially be a box plot or a couple of box plots that you showed in lab one that's okay because I can't think of a better way. You know that I'm in love with box plots, but I can't think of a better way if I was doing a t-test and reporting it in a paper um, that remember all the information that's in the box plot, that, that the fish that did have a lamprey on them have less variability in fork length than the fish that didn't have a lamprey on them. You don't see those uh, outliers on the low end there, the three dots that are... Uh, three unusually small fish. You see a box that's a lot higher. You see uh, on the right, actually a more symmetric distribution. See how the median in the middle uh, between the 75th and the 25th percentile, whereas this distribution here, and we'll see this in a different context in, a, in just a minute. Um, this distribution here is showing you that there's more observations above the median <laughs> that that sounds unusual there's a greater range of observations above the median uh than below so that that's kind of cool it's sort of if you if you put tilt your head sideways you can sort of see the distribution stretching out to the right there but we don't we don't have to imagine that we'll we'll look at it in, in just a second then I've shown you with this script how to put a little subscript. See down in the right-hand corner, 
when we do a t-test, there's two things that you report. You know, Flavia's writing a paper about it. She's got a t-test in there. She says t equals 1.526, p equals 0.131. And so that's what I've got in the in the base of the in the corner there. You don't have to have that subscript. It's just it's a good technique. I I use the technique sometimes. The other thing I do, which I think I've got a script in a week or two uh, with this is I might put the sample size for each of those groups on top of the box just to sort of show folks that I've got this many fish in, in uh, the yes category and this many fish in the no. But so a lot of information there, but it's not a super cluttered um, plot. And, you know, I take that one to a conference or stick it in a, a thesis anytime. So before we go back and look at the gory details of what happened in that, I want to look at the other plots that we've generated because those are about the what I call the diagnostics in doing a t-test where um, you, you're assessing the assumptions that you're making in running a linear model like this. So let's take a look at those. Um, here's an example of looking at one way to look at homogeneity of variance. So what you see on the y-axis, and this is this is a bit tricky, and that's why these are not plots that I would put in my thesis or in a, a presentation. These are more so I can I can assess uh, adherence or not to the assumptions of linear models. So what you're looking at when it says predicted value on the on the y-axis there, the predicted value for each of the groups is just the mean of the group in the t-test context. And the stack of dots that you see on each side are the individual values for the individual fish that are there. And residual means where were they relative to the predictive value? And in this case, it's the mean value for their group. So if I'm looking at that, uh, what would I conclude in terms of variability of these two groups, do you think? There's a group on the left, and if I go back to my plot, so, and, and this is where it gets complicated because the, the more variable group is the no, and that's the group over here, right? because they had a slightly less lower mean of their um, fork length than the, the yes group. But what we're looking at now, we're not comparing the means because they both, in, in each case, we're looking at the variability within the group. So zero is the mean. And these fish had in, in this group had more or sorry, they were above the mean. These fish were below the mean. All we're looking at here is, is the variability, is the scatter within each group about the same. And I would conclude from that, eh, no, it looks like there's a lot of variability, certainly more variability in the, in the one group than the other. And so one thing, one thing that will be in stark contrast to Maybe how you've approached this before. Notice I'm not I'm not testing the hypothesis that variation is greater in one group. I'm I'm eyeballing it. I'm looking at yeah. There's there's more variability in that. And what you're going to do with the same script is I could easily run the log transformed, for example, fork length, and see if using that log transformed data does that result in more similar variability in the two groups. So here's another diagnostic plot. And this is assessing not, is there the same amount of variability in the groups, but if you just bring all the residuals together, one of the assumptions of linear models is that they have an approximately normal distribution. That, that assumption is important when we're actually trying to ascribe uh, a p-value so, you know, when we're testing the null hypothesis and looking at that, that uh, quantile plot there, 
So what's going on there is the data follow a certain range, you know, from the smallest value to the biggest value. And if they were normally distributed, if the residuals were normally distributed, they would track out right along that line that you see there, a straight line. And you can see that there's that big dip at the bottom where th those uh, values have much more negative residuals than expected if it was a normal distribution. So that's evidence that the residuals don't have a normal distribution. And again, in my world, it's all about comparing. I want to look at the log transform data and say, well, is that better adhering? Does it seem to be more normally distributed? The residuals seem to be more normally distributed than with the unlogged data. Another thing that's really important and a really common um, kind of misapprehension with assumptions, especially with regard to normal distribution, is that um, somehow it's about just the data. You know, I collected all these fish, I measured the fork length, and damned if, uh, you know, the fork lengths are not normally distributed, so now I'm going to have to do something. It's not about the, just the raw distribution of your response variable, right? That, you know, if I pile all those values together, it's not about whether they're normally distributed. It's the residuals. It's how values are distributed around the mean value. Do they have an approximately normal distribution around the mean? So that's why we look at this quantile plot of residuals, not actual values. And similarly here, these are the residuals. So they're the difference between the actual value of fork length and the mean value of fork length for the group that the fish was in, either yes or no lamprey attached. And we're looking at the distribution there and that it's sort of a companion to that previous graph. You're, you're answering the question, well, are those kind of, you see the normal distribution behind it. Is that sort of the normal distribution? Well, it's definitely kind of, you know, you can see those more, the negative values out the left side there trailing on more than we would expect with a normal distribution. So that's of concern for us. And we would, we would again, compare it to what we get when we log transform the data. So those are the kind of diagnostics that you do. And then back over in the lower left there in what's called the console, you're seeing the actual um, statistical results of the, of the t-test that you've done. A t-value, and that's, that's where uh, the plot got that value. I'll just put it back over here. Remember in this uh, caption that I have down in the bottom, the t equals 1.526, t equals 0 0.131. I didn't type that in or anything. I just put, it pulled it, as you'll see if you when you look at the script, um, because over here, you'll see the actual sort of printout of the results of the hypothesis test. So we've got um, fork length is the quantitative response variable, and you'll see uh, a test of the null hypothesis that the two groups, lamprey, yes or no, um, the comparison between them, the p-value is 0.131, sorry, the t-value is minus 0.1526, t-value is 0 0.131. So therefore, of course, do we reject or accept? I forget. This is one of those questions like, is anyone with me in the room? <laughs> you would accept, yeah. So remember, you establish, you're, you're the boss. You say alpha is 0 0.05 or alpha is 0 0.01, or we'll talk about in a week or two, alpha 0.2. And once you've established that decision point, then you look at the data and say, okay, my chance of getting these data 
if the null were true, in this case, it's about a 13% chance, 0.13. And compare that to my decision point, which is 0.05. So yeah, I'm not gonna reject that. So yeah, you compare P to alpha. So I won't go through in nauseating detail how I got that, but the data set is there. You know, if you copy down those those folders, subfolders, I've got Mike's data set in there. So all this will work with his data set with the fork lengths and the lamprey, yes or no, in there. And you'll be able to see at each stage, I've tried to flag where I'm doing the uh, different diagnostic plots. And so it'll be easy enough for you to modify these to work with your data set. So what I'd like to do now, we'll, we'll finish with the two-way ANOVA. So I'll click on that and haven't run this one lately. So I'm gonna, my usual technique, and this will probably be uh, engraved on my tombstone. Let's just run it and see what happens. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, so I, this is when I was playing around with ggplot, trying to do nice uh, two-way plots. Because remember, the challenge here, there's different ways to do it. I did it a different way with the... Uh, the clam data and the lecture part, but you're trying to show, you know, you're, you've got two categorical predictors. So you're trying to contrast those, see, test, essentially visually test the three hypotheses as a complement to the statistical results that we'll look at in a sec. So we've got, again, fork length on the y axis there. We've got two sets of box plots here, males and females. And it's, it's kind of cool. I should start using this one for the, uh, the lecture part. So we've got, if this is all I had to go with, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm seeing, so Mike had two populations and I think they were from two different rivers. He just told me uh, in Southwestern Ontario, but we just call them North and South here. And from those two different rivers, the, so the north are, I think that's red, and the south is, is that green or gray or? Yeah, definitely a color outside of that range. So, so notice how north seems to be smaller than south for the males, but females are about the same length. I mean, just, just visually. And again, the bo the box plot's nice because some some people may say, well, you're doing a NOVA, so you should have the means and you should have the pooled standard deviation. No, no, like I'm doing the ANOVA, which has got the information about the hypothesis tests. Here I'm trying to show information, right? I'm not trying to match the ANOVA. So this this is showing so much information. It's got the median of each of those four groups you know, sex cross with population. You're seeing, you know, how much visually the median is different, how much variability is there within the groups and where, which one has the outlier. The males seem to have a few uh, low outliers, the female, there's a couple of high outliers in the South population. lots of information there. And um, if there was something more dramatic going on, you know, we might see, oh, this is the difference for males, and this is the only difference. So it's it's an informative plot. Um, the reason I've got, I decided to use this uh, caption model R squared equals 0.0181. We'll talk about that a little bit. It's sort of an overall measure of how much the model, the predictors, that is sex and population are explaining uh, the response variable for length. So we've got the plot and we've got over in the bottom left corner, there's the two-way ANOVA table, 
right? And the, the only thing I'll say about this um, is don't do this. Like, okay, I'll copy that. I got to get this lab done in the next few minutes. I'll copy that. And then I'll go over to my lab sheet and I'll, uh, if I can ever get a word coming up here, I'll paste it over there and then I'll stick the plot in. So really make that ANOVA table, if you're going to use it, make it nice. <laughs> that's, the, that's the most technical way I can describe what to do. So if I just paste this, you know, it's a dog's breakfast. So you know, I would spell out uh, population. North versus south, you know, all, all that stuff. And and really make sure that your formatting of your numbers, the columns, you want clarity, whether you're figure or table. And I've seen a couple of examples. People have found great examples. They found of terrible tables in addition to terrible figures. But really go for clarity. And as are more important, um, in this case, uh, p-values, that's what that last column is. So the interaction, which we test first, we're not going to reject the null of no interaction. It's got a p of 0.6865. Um, so no interaction, then we go to the main effects, population, nothing going on, sex, nothing going on. There's nothing going on here, right? When you're reporting the p-values, and this is like a universal rule of life, don't just use the digits that they give you. <laughs> you know, like, okay, I better put 0. 0.6865. Like, what, what you do for p-values is, in general, two two sig figs, so 0. 0.69, that tells the story, right? If it's 0. 0.023, that, that tells the story. It's less than 0. 0.05. If it's 0. 0.00002, 38567, and I've seen that literally in a thesis, not just a lab assignment. I've seen that, and it's absolutely do not do that. You know, you would say P is less than 0 0.001, full stop. Because we don't give a shit about it if it's less than, you know, if it's 10 to the minus 16th, or if it's what, we just need to know, yeah, there was less than one in a thousand chance of getting these data if the null was true, right? Being precise or to giving your p-value to umpteen decimal places is a waste of time. And we'll talk more about the, the notion of, you know, if p is 0 0.042, write the paper. If p is 0 0.051, you got nothing to talk about here. You know, there's nothing going. Absolute malarkey, but uh, to quote Joe Biden. But anyway. Be careful in the reporting of those p-values. Don't just do what the um, whatever the stat analysis output is saying to you. It's especially true for sometimes you'll get p equals zero. You know, they'll round it to zero. P equals zero doesn't exist. You know, we're talking about a chance you get those data if the null were true. There's always going to be some chance. It might be 10 to the minus 23. So all you would say in that case is P is less than 0 0.001. That's all that matters, okay? Finally, just to look at what I've done with these scripts and we've done t-tests, this is two-way ANOVA, is you have the same diagnostics because the same assumptions are there. So we're looking, in this case, we've got four groups, not two. So we're looking at up and down, you know, again, I'm, I'm definitely uh, take a look at it and go on the basis of what it looks like. In this case, it looks like, yeah, there's about the same amount of variability in each group. Looks pretty similar. Um, still a non-normality problem there, where remember this, the points are gonna adhere to that straight line. If it's a normal distribution of residuals, we got 
we've got a bunch of super low ones, unusual for a normal distribution. And that, that just shows it even more. So keep in mind, these are not the same residuals as that t-test we just looked at. Same data set. But in this case, they're residuals from four different groups, right? We've got the north females, north males, south females, south males, those four groups, how each fish deviated from the mean of each group. And those four groups of residuals have all been put in the same barrel for looking at this distribution of residuals here. Because when you think about it, when you're doing that two-way ANOVA or multiple regression or whatever, you're assuming that distribution of residuals, it's the same and it's normally distributed around each of those predictive points, whether it's along a regression line or in one of the groups of a two-way ANOVA. So we've got those diagnostics so you can evaluate the assumptions from the two-way ANOVA, and you'll see the same diagnostic plots when you do your multiple regression, um, which we'll, we'll work on next week. Okay? All right, I'm going to talk to these two folks for a little while. And uh, those of you out there, um, yeah, let me know. <laughs> Just, gee. Uh, Sajni. It just says, do you want to remove? <laughs> Shut me. I'm sorry, I clicked that button by accident. I don't know. Why that come. There. So uh, see you next week and get in touch if you have any questions, folks. Thank you. Take care. See ya. Thank you.